Philip uh, Peacock, who is Executive Secretary for Justice and Witness at the World Communion of Reformed Churches. Um, he is a Dalit theologian and has written extensively on issues of Dalit theology. Significant contributions was a book which he co-wrote along with other uh, Dalit uh, theologians and edited that landmark book titled Dalit Theology in the 21st Century, Discordant Voices, Discerning Pathways. Philip is broadly concerned about justice of uh, issues that affect oppressed communities around the world. An out-of-the-box theologian, he has studied and taught systematic theology at the Bishop's College in Kolkata, where he served as associate professor before he was invited to serve the world community of Reformed churches. He's a widely acclaimed thinker, writer, analyst, and speaker. Philip. Uh, thank you so much, Ranjan. And uh, thank you all for taking the time to come to this meeting today. Uh, Ranjan has put me on the spot. Uh, he is a relentless man. And he has put me on the spot particularly because of the way that he has introduced me. Uh, if you say someone's out of the box and someone has to perform to meet those expectations, and I'm going to actually try to do that, Ranjan. Uh, I want to approach this subject a little differently. I would like to approach it from the perspective of Christian-Muslim relations, Christian-Muslim dialogue, uh, where we are at this moment, what are the hindrances to it? And perhaps actually reversing this entire thing when, you, you know, it's not that Christian Zionism is a threat to um, Muslim-Christian relations, but actually how Palestine offers us a model to improve and better our uh, Christian Muslim relations, so to speak. I want to speak basically about three things. Firstly, the state of Christian Muslim relations. Secondly, we've already had outlined for us a historical aspect into the situation of Christian Zionism and the situation in Palestine. What I would like to do really in a second part is to have a theological framing of Christian Zionism and to flesh out some of its theological ideas and then ask the question lastly, how can we move forward, particularly in terms of theological traditions and scripture within both Islam and Christianity, which can offer us a way to move forward. I would like to start from the position of where Muslim Christian relations are today. And unfortunately, when it comes to this particular aspect of interreligious dialogue, we see Muslim Christian relations as some sort of a burden that needs to be overcome and almost an epic sort of a monolith that is difficult to move and we're stuck in a quagmire, so to speak. And there is a certain historical and material background to this. And the first, of course, emerges in European anxieties. Uh, European anxieties about, of course, immigration, European anxieties about their own culture, European anxieties of how to maintain a certain culture which they believe is being invaded from outside and leading to certain tensions within society today, but also historical. But what is happening, of course, at this moment is that history is being read through the eyes of the present. So it's almost as if it's presented, there has been a historical tension between Muslim, uh, Muslims and Christians. Part of this, of course, emerges in the question of Orientalism. Now, Orientalism is an ideology in which Edward Said, for example, quite clearly lets us know Sorry, I lost my slide. Where he lets us know that through the describing, making statements about, and producing knowledge of the colonized, a process of exerting domination and control over the colonized began to exist. So while the study of the colonized on the one hand was a way of exerting domination and control, on the other hand, what this study also did was to firm up certain identity formulations of the colonizer themselves. So they were not just making statements about the colonized and particularly 
uh, the colonizers in the Middle East at the, in, in, in this aspect. But in doing so, they were really also making statements about themselves. And within this context, two trajectories emerged very clearly. Whereas the European Christians, I mean, and these were easily conflagrated identities, perceived them, the colonized in terms of passion, in terms of uh, disorder, in terms of chaos, they also at the same time and necessarily by its opposite, characterize themselves as being reasonable, as being having, you know, intelligence, as working with order. And this kind of thinking actually slowly led to what we can call civilizational opposition. And civilizational opposition was that Western civilization, the civilization of the global North has this particular set of characteristics, whereas the civilization of perhaps the Middle East of civilizations of, the, of, of Asia and much of the global South has these particular set of characteristics. Of course, undergirding this entire thing was a deep form of racism. But more importantly, this idea slowly developed by thinkers like Samuel Huntington into a sense of a clash of civilizations. That there are two civilizations that are now countering each other, are fighting with each other, and there's actually a struggle for global domination. While this may or may not be true, this is definitely how it is posited. And within the context of Christian missiology and Christian theology, this idea was taken forward, particularly by thinkers like Philip Jenkins, to say that there in the area of mission, a clash of civilization, so to speak. So you have Islam and Christianity entering into a religious struggle for religious domination. And this religious domination is of course now being played out not so much in Europe where apparently Islam is so-called winning but really in Africa and Asia. And so there is this, this, this almost unsurmountable uh, mountain, I would say, a cliff that affects Christian-Muslim relations. Now, of course, while this was at the sense of ideology, at the sense of materiality, certain things were happening as well. The first thing that was happening, of course, and we all know this, is when we move towards a fossil fuel-based economic mode, then the struggle for control over these fossil fuels, largely found in the Middle East, which also happens to be uh, Islamic, uh, have an Islamic population, has led to a colossal struggle of resources. And so many wars, colonization over the last 200 years in particular, since fossil fuels have become important. Now, while this materiality of fossil, the struggle for fossil fuels going on and who's controlling, who has access, how this is being distributed are all questions to be asked. At the same time, geopolitics, and this is a part of revolution actually, geopolitics has led to a tension between the various sort of global powers, so to speak. So we start particularly in Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, when Afghanistan was being supported while well, the powers in Afghanistan were being supported by the USSR, the US begins to fund uh, revolutionary forces in Afghanistan as a bulwark against a growing communism. In the same time, in Iran, when there was a revolution overthrowing the US supported Shah, America begins to fear this revolution spreading uh, towards the West, so to speak, and then engages Saddam Hussein in a war against uh, Iran that is going to actually deplete their, their resources and all of this. So we know that these geopolitical movements as far as revolutions in the Middle East, anti-colonial revolutions in many senses, also contributed very strongly towards the idea that there was a West against the East. Okay, so this is the second thing. And the third thing, of course, these groups that were 
supported by the US in particular points of time when the US withdrew support, turned against them. And we know that after the events of September 11th, 2001, there was a realignment, so to speak, of uh, global geopolitics. Uh, realigning it very clearly as you know the European the what they called it the the against the axis of evil the coalition of the willing against the axis of evil and this of course has deeply all of this has deeply affected Christian Muslim relations because at the end of the day what was this being posited as in terms of ideology was a Christian global north fighting against a Islamic global South. And this tension actually was fostered and allowed to exist for its own purposes. Uh, I want to move now to the idea of Christian Zionism and the theological framing of this. Within this whole situation of global, of, of what was happening in geopolitics, a certain sense of Christian Zionism emerges. And how is this theologically framed? And I want to speak about it in three ways. Firstly, it is a totalistic theology. Secondly, it's a mythical theology. And thirdly, it is a theology of election, which I believe must be questioned. So firstly, a totalistic theology. And this is rooted, this totalistic theology of Christian Zionism is rooted in the idea of dispensationalism. Now, dispensationalism is a theological idea that believes that God has created seven different dispensations throughout time, so to speak. And we are now in almost the end times in which certain events have to move and take place in which would lead to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, this is not really a reformed theology. Reformed theology believes that the world can be transformed, that we should involve in transforming the world, but it is really one form of an evangelical theology. And this evangelical theology would say, we need to sit back and let the events of his history unfold to allow for the second coming of Jesus. So Dwight Moody, I think it was, very famously said, it is like uh, what transforming the world is like polishing the brass knobs on a sinking ship. Uh, but we do not believe that the ship is sinking. We believe that we can chart a new course, make people comfortable who are on the ship and actually you know, move forward in a way. But this whole idea of dispensationalism, that there are different parts of, of time and God acts in different ways in this time, that there was a God of judgment and there will be a God of judgment in the future, actually leads to what we can call theologically a God of explanations. That everything in the universe can be explained by a God who is in complete control and has an absolute plan for everyone. That nothing happens without God's uh, planning and God's purpose in it, so to speak. And therefore also it is purposeful that is, uh, Palestine is colonized, that Jerusalem must be given to an Israeli state as its, as its capital and these kind of things. You know, it, this is a really, really part of the history that God has written and is really just being scripted out and unfolding. The unfortunate thing of this God of explanations is that a total theology like this actually leads to totalitarianism. A God of explanations that everything is explained leads to political totalitarianism. The second thing is that this is a mythical theology, that we take certain ideas, stories, and uh, expressions from the from, from a way past actually, and begin to make them have application in the present now. And so we see three things happening. Firstly, theological categories quickly move into social ones. Uh, so you know, a so-called promise to a certain people is now being fulfilled in a very political sense. But more, more than that, what happens with a mythical explanations like this is that in the case of Christian Zionism, it really becomes a shorthand for colonialism. 
Christian Zionism emerging in the 18th century, in, in the 18th, 19th century is not a coincidence. This was an era where it was incumbent on the colonizer to offer a legitimization for their terrible acts of violence and colonialism. And they found Christian Zionism as a way to do that. God has allowed this. God even justifies this. God has planned this. And so it becomes a shorthand for colonialism and shortly after becomes a shorthand for American exceptionalism. So not only is it justified that Palestine is occupied, it is justified that every other place in the world is colonized as well. And it is justified that America now is a city on a hill which has to bring light to the other nations and justifies all the violence and wars of American ex uh, exceptionalism. But more importantly, or actually a part of the entire package is that Christian Zionism is deeply based in an election theology. That there are some people who are chosen which the opposite, of course, is that there are some people who are not chosen. And the people who are chosen, therefore, have the right to do whatever they want. Uh, they have, of course, been chosen by God, and this is God's plan for them. And uh, this becomes a very, very difficult theology, so to speak. I think, particularly speaking from a liberation theology perspective, that we must always question election theologies. To say that we are the chosen people of God, I think is a deeply problematic thing. What we should account for is really, it is the poor, the dispossessed, the colonized who are the chosen people, not the ones who actually are in power. And therefore, as a way of moving forward, I would like to find a theological way of moving forward. Now, as far as Christian Muslim relations and dialogue goes, we have often looked to Abraham as a common ancestor. And I would like to posit that this is actually a problematic place to start. Abraham, the grand patriarch, uh, is, a, is, is perhaps has its place within Judaism, but it has a problematic promise in Christianity. Because also what we do in Christianity is, is there's a deep, as was already said, there was a deep anti-Semitism to this. And what we have done is undercut uh, the Judaistic vision of this and say, actually, we as Christians are drafted as children of faith into Abraham. And uh, not really, we seem to have robbed someone's theology and claimed it for our own, which is of course a very colonial enterprise. In, uh, and we, as Christians, we have contributed to this. As someone has very wisely said, uh, the Bible should come with a warning. Uh, it should say right at the beginning, reading this book may lead you to occupy other people's land. And we have actually done this, occupied other people's land, occupied other people's theologies, and occupied other people's you know, ideologies, so to speak. So Abraham uh, offers us a very, very ambiguous promise, so to speak, as a starting point for Christian-Muslim relations. Uh, even in Islam, actually, unlike Christianity and Judaism, which speaks about uh, God as being the God of Abraham, Isaac, and uh, Jacob, in Islam, God is never referred to in these ways. God is referred to as a God of all people in all nations, rather than, you know, just, uh, you know, this narrow election theologies and God that is monopolized by this patriarch, so to speak. So as a way forward, I would like to offer another starting place. And the starting place that I would like to offer is Hagar. Uh, or Hajira, as she is known in Islam. Now, why is Hagar important for Christians? Hagar comes to us in the Bible as someone who is a slave, someone who is um, a woman, someone who is a foreigner, she's an Egyptian, and she enters into the story as Sarah's slave, and when Sarah is unable to have children, Abraham sleeps with Hagar and has a child. And the story, of course, unfolds within the context of the Bible to show that Hagar is sent out and then she meets God in the wilderness. She names God. God sends her back in this terrible thing, sends her back into a situation of violence. And then she comes out again. I mean, she's thrown out again and is left to fend for herself. And in as much as Christian Zionism is a theology of election, what this particular story really does for us is bring to the forefront the tension that exists between election on the one hand and justice on the other. 
How can we speak about a God who chooses, but also the injustice that is happening to Hagar at the same time? Uh, therefore, a very famous woman theologian, uh, she speaks about Hagar as experiencing exodus without liberation, revelation without salvation, wilderness without covenant, wandering without land, promise without fulfillment, and unmerited exile without return. So we see this, this woman whose story almost uh, runs parallel to the exodus, but not quite because she's not elected. At the same time, Hajira, uh, is an important figure for Muslims, not appearing in the Quran itself, but within the tradition. But in the Muslim reading of Hajira, in the Islamic reading of Hajira, we find firstly, she is left by Abraham in the wilderness out of her own volition, but she is one who is protected by God. In certain traditions, she becomes an Egyptian princess who then has an entire civilization emerging from her. That Ishmael actually is a promise of the new civilization and it is Ishmael and Abraham who build the Kaaba, so to speak. Uh, secondly, within Islamic theology, she's seen as not a victim, but someone who has potential to do great things. And within the, again, Islamic tradition or some Islamic traditions, I should say, there is a rethinking of Hajira herself. Whereas part of the ritual, there is this running between the two mountains. Uh, as, as, and this is actually called the Hijra, so to speak, where the Hijra is the alien. Within Christian and perhaps Judaistic thinking, there is a longing for a land. There is a longing for an occupation within, or, or you know, settling down in the land. Whereas in the Islamic tradition, the idea of the hijra or the alien is actually seen as a blessing. The one who is not rooted, but the one who is moving back and forth is actually seen as one who is blessed because the Prophet Muhammad, peace be unto him, was also one who was an alien who was running away. And I think we can also see the same thing in Jesus. So what does this finally mean for Christian Muslim relations and how do we learn from Palestine? Firstly, I think we have made the glorious mistake of looking at dialogue from the positions of power. That is to say the powerful on both sides come into dialogue with each other. But I think we need to oppose this. If we're looking at Hagar as a model, then we should look at dialogue actually emerging from the perspective of the powerless, the most dispossessed. And really this is the Palestinians, Christian and Muslim Palestinians who continue to bear the burden of occupation and colonialism, of death and annihilation and violence on a daily basis, who really offer us the opportunity for building Christian Muslim relations. Secondly, if you are looking at the Islamic perspective of Hagar, of Hajira, then I think we need to do this with the logic of hope, not with the logic of hopelessness saying, you know, oh my God, these are two absolutely opposite civilizational possibilities with no chance for something coming forward. I think that with the logic of hope to look at what are the possibilities of Christian Muslim dialogue emerging from the people living in Palestine, we have a way of going forward. And most of all, and I'm going to conclude with this, this dialogue would offer us possibilities of bringing us new alliances, new alliances of the dispossessed on both sides of these two faiths coming together to build a world, a new world. And therefore, for me, and I will just, just, just say this last line, Jerusalem offers us this possibility. Where Jerusalem of a place of the dispossessed, a place under occupation, can offer us a way of building a new way, a new alliance for moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Philip. Uh, you are proposing a very richly the theological framework of Christian Zionism uh, in relation to uh, Muslim-Christian relations. And uh, you are leading to new paradigm uh, of dialogue to alliance. Uh, so this is a very positive development. We need to explore more deeply 